Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Marvellous. Well, thank you for coming this evening to, to the second in spring 2019 Gold, Gold Room Lectures. Um, this evening, I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Veronica Collop to Harlickston. Veronica's come from Lancaster University. Now, I don't know if, if you all know where that is, but it's right up in the northwest of, of England, so it's quite a long way that she's come to be with us this evening, so thank you for that. Um, and at Lancaster, Veronica um, is a reader in discourse studies, so she's within the Department of Linguistics, which is one of the biggest uh, departments at Lancaster, and it's generally regarded as one of the top 20 linguistics department in the world and depending on who's recently retired at Lancaster or Edinburgh it is probably the largest or second largest uh, linguistics department in the country. Who's, who's ahead at the moment? Uh, Uta Parton. Pardon? Uta Parton. Uta. No, but, but biggest. Edinburgh or you? Oh. Who's well, retired I don't first? know. I haven't checked. Well, <laughs> well we're going to say it's Lancaster. <laughs> so, Veronica received her PhD in English Linguistics uh, from the University of Vienna, where she studied metaphors in business magazines. Since then, she's been widely published. Her interest in metaphor theories continued with research into business discourse, health communication, language, and sexuality. But her most current work is around Brexit. Now, this evening, we're going to have a talk about Brexit, but we're not going to be talking about Brexit per se. We're not, this is a non-partisan event. We're not talking about whether we should be Brexiting, whether we should be remaining. But what, we, what we are going to hear about is the language of Brexit and how people describe what has happened and how that has changed. So with that, I shall hand you over to Veronica. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you very much for the invitation to this splendid place and for turning out in such numbers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, as Nicola said, my official job title in Lancaster is Reader in Discourse Studies, which basically means that my research is about how people use language to represent the world, talk about their experiences, and form identities and organize their relationships, socially speaking. As Nicholas also said, I'm interested in business, healthcare, and at the moment, very much politics. Why are we here? <laughs> Don't know about you, but um, one thing we can say is that Brexit is now getting very real indeed. So it's just over six weeks until the UK is scheduled to leave the European Union. But remarkably, nobody seems to know how exactly it will happen at this moment in time. So perhaps we should all take a step back and take stock of what led us to this moment. And of course, me being a linguist, I'm particularly interested in the role that language played in getting us to this moment. So, what will I be talking about with that focus? I'll first give a bit of historical context, because I think that's needed, you know. So, a um, bit of voices from history, as I call it. Then a big chunk on politicians' voices before, after the referendum, most recently about what the media have to say, that'll be relatively brief and business. And then also, how do citizens, you and I, the voters, how do they, have, how have they talked, how do they talk about Brexit and the whole process around it? And I'll finish with a bit of a summary and an outlook as far as you can have an outlook at this moment in time. I'm aware that there are things missing. What's missing is voices from outside the UK. So this is very Britain-centred. There is some research on how Brexit is, for instance, reported in you know, papers in Turkey, Portugal, but also the US. For tonight, I've decided to keep it um, British focused and see how these different stakeholders, like politicians, citizens, media, etc., interact with each other. But you could be forgiven for thinking that they're all shouting into their own void, but we shall see that they actually do interact with each other, if indirectly. So what's all this based on? So I'm reporting on research, 20 plus years worth of it, by various people, including myself, which, who have worked on the language aspect of the relations between the United Kingdom and the EU, starting with the early 1960s until, yeah, earlier this year, really, so late last year. 
One publication was done by Bournemouth University, that was one that came out very quickly, very short pieces, one-page pieces by academics, more about the media use. Yeah. Then there's one book called The Language of Brexit, and allow me to say somewhat facetiously that the first four chapters are actually on the language as well. Um, and one book here is the, a publication that I'm involved in, it's called Discourse of Brexit, and it's going to be published in two weeks' time. You have a flyer on your seats, so you may have seen that. Uh, so some of this is all still forthcoming. In the following, when you see a reference and it has this little red star next to it, that means it's from the book. Okay, but I present other stuff as well. Just on references, if you're interested in following this up, I've got a list of references here, so just approach me. Okay, so let's get started with Voices from History. Okay, let's contextualize this a bit. Because, as you may or may not be aware, the 2016 referendum about the EU membership of Britain wasn't the first of its kind. There was actually another one back in 1975, which is a while back. And the story goes back even further than that. So, um, there were, in fact, if you thought that the referendum campaign in 2016 was sometimes, you know, taxing, maybe, spare a thought for people in the 60s and 70s who had three campaigns on what was then called the European Economic Community in quick succession. So, in 1961, Britain first applied to join what was then called the Euro European Economic Community, that was vetoed by the French, President, then President Charles de Gaulle. They tried again a couple of years later, same story, Charles de Gaulle said, no, not happening. 69, he retired, Britain tried again, and then finally, third time lucky, in the view of some, others less so, um, joined the, what was commonly then referred to as the common market. So, you know, this trading bloc of European countries. But only two years later, it already had a referendum on do we actually want to stay in the common market that we joined two years ago. And in between that, you had um, all these campaigns, you know, to persuade the public, and they really were meant to be persuasive campaigns in favour of EEC membership. So various governments of various stripes, historically, were very much in favour of joining what was known as the common market. It has been shown, because it was sort of official government policy to join and stay, that pro-campaigners had really disproportionate access you know, to communication channels, money, other government resources, etc. And they used a range of different types of texts. So you had speeches, you had editorials and newspapers, you had hoardings like displayed in public, and you had leafleting campaigns to households. So some of you who lived in the country in 2016 may remember that the government of the day did something very similar. Every household got this leaflet, why the government believes that voting to remain is the best option for the UK. Right? So that is not something that was done for the first time back then. Obviously, back in the mid-1970s, media coverage was much less concentrated on television formats, and you didn't have face-to-face -face debates as you do now, or not so many at any rate. Historians of that are a bit divided in how they evaluate that. Some will say that the media really played a big role in educating the public about the pros and cons. Others see it more as basically a government-led propaganda campaign, really, in pro-European one. And I guess, as ever, that depends on your political viewpoint, how you assess that. What's true, though, is that national sovereignty, so Britain being independent and a sovereign state, was debated both in 2016, and since indeed, and but also in these previous campaigns. Okay. Except it had more traction in 2016 because it then became linked to free movement and immigration to the UK. Good. Um, what we saw very quickly happening after the 1975 referendum, where two-thirds of voters said, yes, we want to stay in the EEC, European Economic Community, that very quickly the press, or large parts of the press, turned very Eurosceptic, or sometimes outright hostile. So there was a move a bit from cautious optimism to quite aggressive opposition in some cases. So, especially in tabloid newspapers, so, you know, if you things like the Sun or the Daily Mirror, so, um, which are sometimes in this country contrasted with so-called quality or broadsheet newspapers. 
Um, so, and that hostility increased as the EU, as it became then, became more of a supranational entity, less of a trading bloc and more of a political entity, really. And some people thought, well, this is not what we signed up for, right? And parts of the press turned very hostile to the so-called European project. Um, but there were also cultural resentments, historic resentments, especially against Germany and France at the time still. So a bit of a hangover, if you will, from World War II, really. Lots of ink has been spilled on why uh, the press turned so Eurosceptic or even hostile, why Euroscepticism became you know, so well established. Some will say, well, the European Union became sort of an outsider, the other, and against which Britain could find its identity because it was no longer you know, the center of an empire. So now it saw itself as being against the EU and that brought some people together. That's one way of accounting it, there are others. What you often have in the Eurosceptic press, though, is so-called Euro-myths. Yeah? So like the idea about the EU regulates what shape bananas need to have. Okay? So that's just one story. There were quite a few of those. They are so prevalent, these Euro-myths, that the European Commission has actually set up a dedicated website, which they call the myth-busting website, you know, where they list all these myths about what the European Union allegedly does. Um, Certainly a valiant attempt. How successful it is, I wouldn't comment, you know. Um, but what we do have is very much, especially in the tabloid newspapers, a depiction of the EU as bureaucratic and run by humorless and absurd bureaucrats. And there, against that, they profile the figure of some sort of stereotypical Brit, you know, who is irreverent and unmasks these absurd Brussels bureaucrats with humor and very often nuendo as well and claims to British exceptionalism. So that's something we'll encounter again. So that's the idea that Britain is different and Britain is special. Yeah, and it's different from all the other countries in the EU. We'll come back to that. If we look at politics, um, people have also looked at how in the 70s and 80s politicians talked about Britain and the EU. Um, and it's a bit of a mixed picture, really. And that will continue, as we shall see, into the present day. So the idea that, you know, um, conservative politicians, the Tory party often uh, said it's good to be within the EU, so the idea of being in a container within the EU, but at the same time they sort of draw a difference between us and them, us, the British, them, the EU, while at the same time saying, but we're actually in it, but we're separate. So there's a bit of a contradiction there. Right? That holds for both conservative and Labour politicians of that era. Right, so let's look a bit at what um, politicians had to say more recently and how they talked about um, all things EU, UK, etc., Brexit. So first of all, this is a graph just to show topics in parliamentary debates. You may or may not know that there is a record of all British parliamentary debates. It's called the Hansard Record. It's a fantastic resource, you know, where you have basically the recordings of everything that was said in Parliament. And this graph shows, uh, you know, from the 1800s, how parliamentarians, how much they talked about things to do with the empire. That's the blue line. And you can see that decreasing pretty sharpish after World War II, 1950s, you know, when uh, the colony, former colonies became independent. At the same time, you can see a rise in topics to do with the commonwealth. So words to do with the commonwealth. But then, in the 1960s, when Britain first applied to join the common market, etc., you can see the green line really shooting up. And then again after the 70s. So that is words to do with Europe, European, European Union, etc. So you can see just how dominant that got. But you can also see in the most recent data a slight dip. Okay, maybe a hobbing of things to come. Okay, let's look at individual politicians then. Let's start with the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, who called the referendum in the first place. On 23rd of January 2013, so pretty much exactly six years ago, he gave what was, came to be known as his Bloomberg speech. And people have said that this really set the terms for the whole debate up to and beyond the referendum, really. And linguistic colleagues have shown that he really linguistically, with language that pretty much the same as other British politicians did. Okay, so representing the EU as separate from the UK, but at the same time saying we should stay in the UK. 
Let's have a look at a bit of an extract from that speech, okay? So, he says here, I know that the United Kingdom is sometimes seen as an argumentative and rather strong-minded member of the family of European nations. Okay, so seen probably by other family members, but note the metaphor here. So he talks about the EU and Europe as a nation, as a family. Yeah, and Britain is part of that family, perhaps a bit of a difficult uncle or relative, but no you know, still that metaphor of belonging together. And then he talks a lot about we, and we here is not Europeans, but we is we the British. He says, we have the character of an island nation, independent, forthright, passionate in defense of our sovereignty. This incidentally, almost verbatim, word for word, echoes what the French president, Charles de Gaulle, said when he refused Britain's application to join the EU. He said, England in effect is insular, she is maritime, and she is too different to join us. Yeah, so that's almost, I don't know if Cameron was aware of that, but it's almost an echo of Charles de Gaulle, really. So, and then he says, Cameron, that is, we can no more change this British sensibility than we can drain the English Channel. So our mindset is as natural as, you know, geography, nothing we can do about it. And because of this sensibility, we come to the European Union, so that's them now, with a frame of mind that is more practical than emotional. Right? So, come to, we come to the European Union. If you have, can come to something, you have to be separate. If you're already part of it and in it, you can't come to it anymore, right? So that is a bit of a separation there. Then he also says we're more practical than emotional, as a comparison. So does he imply here that Europeans, continental Europeans, are more emotional than the Brits? You could read that into it. And then he says, he talks about this, there's a gap between the EU and the citizens, and that is particularly felt in Britain. So again, Britain is special, Britain is exceptional, Britain is different. Okay. Good. Um, let's see what other European um, heads of government and heads of state do. Yeah, just anecdotally. Here we have Angela Merkel and, François and, and Emmanuel Macron. Okay, um, this was taken at Armistice Day last year. So, and how do they talk about themselves, their own country, Germany and France, compared to the EU? Here's a translation of a speech. These are both addresses, like State of the Union addresses, sort of, that they gave in their own countries. And Angela Merkel says, she talks about we Europeans. Yeah, the European was the best idea we Europeans had in the 20th century. Okay, you, find, you don't really find we Europeans in the language of British politicians, that phrase. Okay. Um, despite all the difficulties and hardship, so she acknowledges that, the European Union has proved a blessing, or has to prove lucky, especially for us Germans. So here now the we is something else, that's more the nation, right? Because let's face it, the world around us is uncomfortable and complex. I'm not sure, is that around Germany or around Europe? Not quite sure. Probably Europe, because she goes on to say, today Europe is surrounded by major conflicts, stability, violence, etc., etc., and they are on our doorstep. So this is the idea of Europe or the European Union even being like a house, and you have all these problems just on the doorstep, so it's better to stay in the house where you're safe. That's the point she's making with that metaphor. Okay? Good. Let's look at then Macron, um, what he says. So, he says, we never need Europe more than now. Okay. And then he says, quite interestingly, Europe is us, just as we are in Europe. Okay, so there's almost, we're the same as Europe. Right? And, but then he goes on to say, Europe, that is us, and also things other than us. It's familiar and foreign at the same time. So, quite a differentiated picture. But then he says, you cannot understand France without understanding Europe. Right, so we're inextricably bound to it through history and all the rest of it. So, quite complex what's going on here, I won't get into all the detail, but I hope you can see how this talking about the, their own country and Europe is quite different from what we found David Cameron to be saying. Okay. Good, let's go on to another politician. No, you can't do without Nigel Farage when you talk about Brexit. <laughs> you know, gotta have it. Okay, so this is a study from the forthcoming book. This is uh, from, an, from a contributor who looked at a couple of speeches by Nigel Farage 
over only three years, 2014 to 16, and he showed how his language and his rhetoric becomes ever more radical over only three years leading up to the referendum. Okay? So let's have a look at that. The first is Nigel Farage in 2013. Okay? The fact is we just don't belong in the European Union. So echoes of the island nation there, etc. Britain is different. Yeah? So this again. This is again what Charles de Gaulle said, what Cameron said. That's the idea of British exceptionalism. Yeah? Our geography puts us apart. Remember Cameron, we can no more drain the English Channel. Very similar here. Our history puts us apart. So again, yes, literally Britain is set apart as a landmass by the Channel, but history puts us apart, that's a metaphor. Right? That's creating distance in the mind, if you will. Our institutions produced by that history put us apart. We think differently, we behave differently. So that's him in 2013. That's him only about a year later. Yet instead of listening to those who elected them, the government takes orders from the European Union. So there's the voters, on whose behalf he purports to speak. Then there's the UK government, and then there's the European Union, which is there. Yeah? And the European Union is throwing open our borders to more than 30 million Bulgarians and Romanians who may be coming to settle here. So that's a third group of them, right? Eastern European potential immigrants. And then he says they're throwing open the door, so they're doing it now, right? So this is happening now, is what he's saying with this verb form. Yeah? So a bit of a, perhaps an impending sense of threat here. Um, and then he says, who may be coming to settle here? So he leaves it open. Yeah, they may or may not. It's still a possibility rather than a certainty. What do we, the British, call it, if not yet another sovereignty-stepping power grab from EU elites? Okay. And this is Farage in 2016. This is really now in the month leading up to the referendum. He says, to those who are happy to welcome immigrants at our doors, here we have the doors again. Remember Angela Merkel at our doorstep? but with he meant the whole European house. He means Britain. Okay. I have a suggestion. Go and see the refugee camps in Turkey, see the gangs and the riots, see the young Muslim criminals, see the anger, violence and terror. It is there and it is ready for export. So he is making basically the same argument as Merkel, there's danger at the doorstep, but to an opposite effect. For her, this is an argument to stay for the European Union, for him it's an argument against. And then he says, this kind of evil might not have reached us yet, but it is well in sight. So this is imminent danger now. Yeah, this is no longer possible. This is imminent danger. We can already see them all coming, almost literally. And there is no one in Brussels who can protect us, us when it comes. So he doesn't say anymore if it comes, or they may be settling here. Now he says when it comes. So it's no longer a possibility, it's a certainty. Yeah, so he's sort of retreats up this threat level here. Okay, the perceived threat level. Okay, let's go on to another politician who many would regard as being on the opposite side of the spectrum of Nigel Farage. He's the leader of the opposition party in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Corbyn has a very long track record of being a Eurosceptic. Okay. So he had voted to leave in that early referendum, 1975, he has opposed major treaties that were meant to integrate the European Union. And he has also pretty constantly over the decades that he's been in Parliament distanced himself from the official pro-EU line that Labour once had. Okay, and being quite a vocal critic of the EU on many occasions. So this is from a number of speeches by him. And what can we see here? Just to point out a few things. Right, so the EU also knowingly deliberately maintains a number of tax havens and etc. I think we should be making demands. We, the British, need to make demands on them, the European Union. We've had that before, right? This separation between us and them. And here's a list then of demands that he wants to make. Here's a variation on this where he puts Europe under obligation, and he here actually means the EU. Europe can and must do far more to meet the needs of our people. Right. Europe has to develop a fairer and more effective mechanism. Europe needs to change. So putting them under an obligation for, to our favour. And then finally, this is now after the referendum, okay, and in the run-up to the 
2017 general election that was held then. Okay, so he talks about the people, which he does a lot in his speeches. Yeah, so it's the second most frequent word he uses in all his speeches after the word labor, which is like the name of his party. Okay. So uh, he talks about people being left behind and having lost out, etc., etc. Right, so not too different from other politicians we have seen, although at first glance we would think that they're quite different in their political, um, political ideas, but perhaps not so much in their language. Right, so here's Jeremy Corbyn contrasted with Prime Minister, both of them on Twitter in this case. So, so what we have here is basically they criticise each other, right? The Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition. So Corbyn says, the Prime Minister's Brexit negotiation strategy has been a disaster. From day one, she has looked incapable. It's interesting, isn't it? He didn't say he, she has been incapable. So he has this sort of remnant of politeness there, saying she looked incapable. Yeah. The political games from both the EU and our government need to end because no deal is not an option, in his view. So um, he has here two groups that are them, out groups, the EU and our government. He's against both of them. There's no we. Keep the political games in mind, though, because here's what Theresa May said around the same time, really. So she says, we will make a success of Brexit, so very confident here. And. Um, and no matter what the outcome of the negotiations. And then she says, Labour should pl stop playing politics with Brexit. Now, this is basically an echo of, you know, Theresa May's political games must stop. So they echo each other. Yeah. So I think when people engage with each other a lot, and even as adversaries, they start, end up sounding like each other a bit. And that's what seems to be happening here, really. Good. Here's another study. This is a study, again, from the forthcoming book, where somebody looked at just the Conservative Party. Okay, so in the lower House of Parliament, the House of Commons, and she looked at how Conservatives talked before the referendum, talked about the EU and Britain, again. She looked specifically at we are. So just the phrase we are, yeah, and looked at that in like 15 months worth of these parliamentary records, about half a million words just the phrase we are, and then she looked at, okay, so how do conservatives who supported leave, leaving the EU, talk about Britain and the EU, and how did so-called Remain supporters among the Conservative Party do that? So this is conservative only. So in a nutshell, conservatives who supported leaves would see, construct the EU as an oppressive force, and again, the idea that Britain is different. Okay? So here's couple of, bit of a flavour of this. Nobody would sign up to such a deal, but that is in effect what we are being asked to sign up in the EU, for, in the EU referendum. So, language-wise, you have a passive voice here. It's not they are asking us, but we are being asked by somebody who's not mentioned. Right? So we're at the receiving end of something. And this idea of being passive gets even stronger in the second quote. As we are driven in the EU vehicle towards ever closer union, a political union, how does it help to try to fit a couple of emergency brakes that lie within the control of the EU, not us? This is a very popular metaphor in Brexit language. Yeah, so the idea of a car journey, you know, being on a journey, well, and then it again depends on your political viewpoint, a journey to, you know, better places or a road to nowhere or whatever it is, how people then elaborate the metaphor. Right? But again, we are being driven. Yeah? We have no power, we have no control, says that explicitly at the end. Right? So this idea of powerlessness, being acted upon rather than being able to do anything. And then somebody again talking about the UK being different, which we've heard a couple of times now before. So that's the leave conservatives. You would perhaps expect that. But now look at what conservatives did who supported Remain. Basically, they say that membership in the EU is problematic and Britain is exceptional. Right, so again, this idea of Britain being different, being exceptional, etc. But also, so this is Remain supporters among Conservatives, and one of them says, an obvious example is our obligation as a member state to transpose EU law, particular areas, so long as we are a member of the European Union. So that leaves open the possibility that at one point we may not be, so long as we are means, but if we are not anymore, this is from Remain supporters, right? 
And then they say, and this is a real formula in Remain language, this organization is imperfect and can sometimes be frustrating, but we are still better off it. And you find that again and again and again with Remain supporters across the political spectrum. The EU is not that great, but it's still better to be in it. And that keeps cropping up again and again. Okay. And then again, the idea of Britain is different, Britain is exceptional. Yes, we are part of the European Union, conceding that, almost, you know, not wanting to perhaps, but we are doing it as a proud nation state, so the refocusing on the nation state. You can almost read these comments as, you know, the Remain supporters in that party being a bit like the weaker version of their Leave supporting colleagues, really. What we don't have, really, is a very outspoken positive case for the for EU membership. It's always, yeah, it's not that great, but... And then, let's finally, before we leave the politicians, let's look at um, the Leave and Remain campaigns. Okay? So... Lots of research has been done on that. I'll just summarize this for you. Okay. So one thing is, of course, and that's why I talked a bit about the voices of history, that there was a very strong Eurosceptic and anti-EU discourse in some sections of the press already. So that was already very well established. Yeah? So uh, that's, of course, something that Leave supporters could then capitalize on because the, sort of the groundwork had been laid, if you will. Okay. But let's see what else has happened. So... So, the Vote Leave campaign had a very strong thematic focus on immigration. Um, it also produced, in terms of how it used the media, it produced a lot more press releases and faster. So it was more reactive to news of the day. It appealed to both positive and negative emotions. People have looked at Facebook engagement yeah, of the Leave campaign Facebook page. Um, so the supporters there, the people who supported that group, also expressed hope and a desire for freedom, sovereignty, etc. And here's a quote. They said, if we vote to leave the EU, we will be able to save £350 million a week. Okay, so how that is constructed, let's not go into whether this is an actual fact or not, but the way it is talked about is with complete certainty. We will be able to save that. No reason for doubt here. This is what will happen. Contrast that with the Remain campaign, Britain stronger in Europe. So their focus was on the economy, not a topic that stirs as many emotions as immigration. Uh, they produced fewer press releases and had greater intervals between them, and it was mostly plant material, so they weren't, you know, they didn't react so much. They appealed also to emotion, but only negative emotion, and they appealed a lot to rationality, especially economic rationality. Now, both negative and positive emotions can be very strong motivators to vote one way or another. But whether it be strong negative or positive emotion, fear, pride, what have you, um, emotion itself is stronger than rationality usually as a, you know, as a voting motivation, which means that the Leave campaign, with its stronger focus on emotions, had a very clear advantage. Again, the Facebook posts of the Remain campaign repeated these economic arguments and negative emotions, and they used language differently. So they said cheap, for instance, cheap flights between European destinations could be put at risk, may or may not, whereas we have a lot of confidence on the leave side. That will happen. Here's, oh, it could. And then again, this formula that we've seen before, this time from a Labour politician, Europe's not perfect, but we will still get a better deal if we work together. This formula of EU is not great, but we're better off it. So again, no positive case, really, for the EU. And also, something very basic that is so basic that people often overlook it, including my linguistics colleagues. Vote leave. That's an imperative form. That's asking you to do something. Britain stronger in Europe, that could be a sentence. That could be something like Britain is stronger in Europe, would be stronger in Europe, etc. It doesn't engage. If you ask somebody to do something, vote leave, take back control, you immediately engage people. If you make a statement, well, you may listen to that statement or agree or not, but you're not as engaged. So, what's the picture so far then? So, depending on who you listen to at the time, the EU 
pretty much by everyone is seen as problematic and deficient, leave and remain politicians alike, very often seen as acting on its member states. Leave support is very much thought as disempowering both the UK government and voters. <coughs> In parts of the press, it continued to be constructed as an unreasonable authority that needs to be resisted by people and whoever sets themselves up as the people's hero. And we often have metaphors around oppressive forces, prisons, you know, breaking free from the shackles of the EU, that sort of metaphor. Britain is seen as different and exceptional by, again, across the spectrum, but at the same time, both part of the EU and separate from it. So this tension that we saw historically persists. And in leave discourse, it's also very much seen as being threatened by immigrants. The Remain campaign, we saw rationality and negative emotions, but it, we also saw that it sounded less than certain, somewhat apologetic. Whereas the Leave campaign triggered, talked more about emotions of all kinds, but sounded more confident and was simply by the language used more engaging. So, Let's move on to some shorter parts then before I wrap up. Let's look a bit at media voice and business voices. Okay. Here's a study that I did with a colleague, which we always call our morning after study, somewhat flippantly. <laughs> this is us looking at news reports and editorials in the most popular online news sites in Britain the morning after the referendum. Okay. And as it happens, the three most popular news websites in Britain, you know, in terms of viewer statistics, happen to be BBC News, The Guardian and The Mail Online. So The Guardian very strongly supported Remain, The Mail equally strongly supported Leave, BBC as a public sector broadcaster is obliged to be impartial. <laughs> so, um, we were particularly interested in metaphor here. The first thing we could see is we wanted to know how they talk about Britain and the EU. And we soon found they don't very much. The very morning after the referendum, what the news websites talked much more about was the relationships between voters and politicians in Britain. So they really focused on Britain itself. They didn't talk that much about Europe anymore, or the EU even. So, BBC News, they very much talk about divisions within the electorate. Yeah, this is from an editorial. So they talk about dangerous divisions within the electorate that shall lie just beneath the surface. Whereas the Guardian addresses more the divisions between voters and politicians who are meant to represent the voters. Yeah, so they talk about mending the link between the electors, the voters of Britain, and the mostly pro-European representatives who they elect. So that's a different division there. Not within the electorate, but between electorate and establishment. And funnily enough, The Guardian, although politically it's very left-wing or left, left of centre, the male is pretty right-wing, they are surprisingly similar. Because they both focus on this division between establishment and electorate, but from opposite viewpoints, if you will. The Guardian does it more from the point of view of the establishment, the Daily Mail more from the point of view of Leave voters. <coughs> so they talk about Leave voters as united, <coughs> But then they also say that Leave voters, you know, are basically, they use lots of violence and battle metaphors here. They, you know, they are bombarded by the government, but they rise up against, you know, the government, etc. So they see it a bit as a people's revolt, really. But what we found really striking is the shift away that early on after the referendum, away from a focus on Europe to with an inner British focus, really. The divisions within Britain. So a bit of soul searching starting there already. Two other people who have contributed to the book have looked at how the word Brexit is used in only The Guardian, right? So a broadsheet newspaper usually has a reputation as being quite left of centre. So, unsurprisingly, you know, the frequency of the word Brexit really goes up pretty dramatically in 2016 and stays high ever, ever since, really. What they did is they looked at every article that was published on The Guardian website between 2000 and 2017. So 17 years worth of Guardian articles, that's just about 1.3 billion words. They obviously didn't sift through that by hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so there's a subfield of linguistics which looks at you know, computer application of analyzing very large collections of texts like this. Okay. So, and then they look at where does Brexit actually occur? So it was first mentioned um, in the business section 
actually. And in, back in 2012, yeah, was, that was the first mention in The Guardian, at least. But then, you know, it spread most in politics, as you would expect. Yeah, and then in the comment website, where readers can have their comments, then Business World News, UK News, okay, but it spread by the end of 2017, it had spread everywhere. You know, they found that there were even 12 occurrences of Brexit in the crossword section of the Guardian. <laughs> and I guess if you're in the crossword section, you can say that you've entered the lexicon of a language. They were then particularly interested in how the Guardian's business pages write about Brexit. Okay, so what they looked at is when you look at how the word Brexit is used in the business section of the Guardian, okay, how is that different from how the word Brexit is used in the whole of the Guardian? So what is specific about talking about Brexit in the business pages? Okay. So, and they said, what words does it occur with? So if we just look at how Brexit, the word, is used in the business pages of the Guardian, what other words co-occur co -occur around it, around the word Brexit? So you have vote, obviously, but then you have uncertainty. Yeah, so the link between Brexit and uncertainty is particularly prominent in the business pages. Yeah, and pound, as you would expect. Yeah, what impact does it have on the currency? We also then have, lower on, we have also words like fears, worries, concerns, etc. Yeah, so the concerns of business, the uncertainty, etc. Right, so before the referendum they say, you know, Brexit would hit wages, so this might happen. After the referendum that has become a certainty, Brexit has hit investment. Okay. Right, so very strongly here an echo of the remain focus on the economy but also on negative emotion. There has been surprisingly little research on how business talks about Brexit. That may be because for the longest part, um, or for a long time, uh, there wasn't a lot of public discourse, so not many companies and businesses came out publicly on Brexit, um, because that's usually not how companies operate. It's only more recently, really, that they make a contribution to the public debate. But one colleague of mine looked at how Brexit talked at in the annual reports by financial companies. Yeah, so um, the likes of Barclays, HSBC, Lloyds, Royal Bank of Scotland. Okay. So in their annual reports, do they talk about Brexit, if so, how? And that's between 2015, 16, 17. Okay. So when they talk about their financial performance, does Brexit come up at all? Um, it does. And again, unsurprisingly, it peaks in 2016 and then stayed high. Um, again, it, spreads, it starts in the risk review section of the annual reports the financial reports. So they first talk about Brexit in the risk review section, they frame it as a risk, and then it spreads to other sections as well. And it comes together with either neutral words, like consequences, impact, but mostly with negative words. Adversely challenges, instability, risks, and yes, uncertainty. There it is again. Okay. What's interesting is that, you know, when they use the word Brexit and what happens around it, up until 2017, that's mostly the same. It doesn't change much. They don't talk about particular measures they've taken or actions they've taken, etc. This has, of course, changed. We now know, and we hear it daily, almost on the news, that companies do take action, and especially preparing for a no-deal Brexit. And more recently, they have also started intervening in the public debate. Here's two examples. So this is the Weatherspoons newsletter, the pub chain in Britain, whose uh, managing director is a very outspoken Brexit supporter. And he used a medium, you know, so we're back to the media here, the sort of newsletter of his pub, where you know, they advertise for the pub, they have little stories, sort of customer newsletter. He used that most recently um, to propagate his views on Brexit. Really. Um, so, in a caricature fashion, making fun of, um, of politicians that he disagrees with. Okay. On the other hand, we have then one of those financial companies I just talked about, HSBC. That was a hoarding I saw a couple of weeks back. Yeah, we are not an island and then the international links of Britain. We are something of part of something far bigger. So, here we're back to the notion of an island nation or not. Back to David Cameron, back to Thaldegon. 
Finally, to wrap up, let me talk a bit about the voices of what's sometimes known as the person in the street, the voter, the general public, the citizens, etc. Just two things here. One is a study I did with a colleague. We looked at the man, mostly the man that is, a bit of the woman as well, on the street. So we looked at these so-called vox pops. You know what vox pops are? Yeah, these on-street interviews that journalists do. So when they come, go up to people and say, what is your view on... And you present it with a microphone and have to say something coherent and preferably clever. Okay, so vox pops. <laughs> okay, so what we did... Um, I have put women in brackets here because we looked at people who were interviewed on the street who declared that they would, would vote leave okay, in the run-up to the referendum. And the leave voters were actually, uh, just under three quarters of them were men. There's various reasons of that, why that might be the case, which I won't go into here, but um, you know, there's various ways why that might be the case, but that's a fact. <coughs> okay, and we looked at what they said, how they talked about it, etc in these Vox Pops, so we have worked with videos from the four nations of the United Kingdom, so Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales and England, and various parts of England. Okay. So, um, could be official news reports from the BBC or CNN, uh, could be individual YouTube channels, private TV channels, student projects even, anything we could find on YouTube, basically. So, mostly people oriented to sovereignty, perhaps unsurprisingly but followed by the economy. Economy and immigration as a tie, then the money paid to the EU, border control, the EU is deficient. So here's a bit of a flavor of that. So the idea that Britain is powerless because it's part of the EU. What's the point of me electing our own MPs and our own leaders to make rules and laws for us while everything is being done in Brussels? What's the point? So the idea of sovereignty and a perceived lack of sovereignty. But we also found personal stories, what it meant for people's very individual life work. Here's somebody saying, I was homeless from November to February. I was told that we couldn't get any help because the migrants come in here and Brighton and Eastburn are housing a thousand of them. Okay, so that is what he gave as his reason why he voted leave. So a very personal story. Or economic arguments. This is a farmer from Wales. At the moment, we are paying six billion pounds as a UK government into the cap in Brussels. We are only getting 3.8 billion back. What the hell is happening with these other 2.2 billion? It's not fair on us at all, is it? So this is the notion of fairness is what benefits us. Yeah, so there's no idea that this might go to other countries, just like money from other EU member states has gone into Wales, for instance. Okay, so a particular notion here of what constitutes fairness. So they mostly talk about it in terms of if we were not part of the EU, we would be more capable. We could do more things. We could employ more people. We would have more leeway. But they also talk about in terms of what's right and proper, even moral to do, like Quote, we need to pay more attention to our own country and not don donate so much money to other countries. Okay, so it's an argument in terms of capability, but also an argument in terms of morality. And in general, we could say that they have a bit of a collective identity. They see themselves as very much disadvantaged, yeah, being disempowered, and the whole country being basically helpless and disempowered and somewhat oppressed, not, no, not in control. So there's a strong alignment with British and Britain, both of them are constructed as helpless, the EU as the other. So the EU disempowers Britain, disempowers me, even. But then it follows, of course, that if we leave, we have more power. But what was interesting is the people also said the very fact that we can have a vote on this is already empowering. Good. And then finally, Twitter. Now, a couple of people who look at the Twitter hashtag on the, in the months after the Brexit vote. Now, you can imagine what happened on Twitter, right? Just when the voting results came through, it just exploded. So, and somebody actually took the pains of collecting this, or the, you know, Twitter that had the Brexit hashtag in it, and um, where were private individuals, and in English. They also controlled for bots. Okay, that's an interesting side story here. Right, we know that Twitter is not representative. Right? It's not representative of the population at large. It has been shown that it's very motivated, especially when people want to complain about something. So when you feel negative, you go on Twitter, basically. We also know that Twitter users are younger than the average, not exclusively. And when it comes to political debate, they're mostly male. 
or more often than not, they're male. Um, for Brexit, people used Twitter for various things. So in general, they shared information, yeah, they expressed their own emotions or views, or sometimes they engaged in play, things like that. <laughs> Very often, they expressed their emotions. Yeah, so they used a lot of emotion words. This is so sad, or I've never felt prouder. Or they make general statements or thoughts. Sometimes you just don't know if you have to laugh or cry, in view of this. Or they attributed emotion to somebody else. So they said the Iron Lady, that's former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, is smiling down tonight next to a, photo, a picture of Margaret Thatcher. Okay, so emotion to somebody else. Or directives, you know, somewhat facetious here. Not to worry, you know. <laughs> Arguments. Some people do try to have arguments on Twitter. I mean, not arguments in the terms of a fight, but arguments in terms of, you know, arguments, a debate. Okay, maybe there is hope, maybe individuals are learning, and very often there's a link then to personal life. Okay, I think we all need a bit of cheering up a bit, so here's a picture of my new Bengal kitten dove. You be on Twitter long enough, you do find a kitten picture. It's inevitable. Okay, so that's a lot I've thrown at you, isn't it? Long. And that was a selection. So let's summarize this a bit. Try to do it in one slide. So, what are the main points then? So, both Leave and Remain campaigners represented the EU as deficient, but Leave campaigners also talked about it as disempowering on a personal and country level. Remain politicians and campaigners largely failed to present the EU in positive terms or make a positive case for membership. Remain supporting media echoed that. They echoed the campaign's thematic focus on the economy and their negative emotions. Companies showed a negative stance on Brexit to the extent that they spoke publicly. The Leave campaign, we can say, was focused on engaging and the Leave arguments and motions were very much echoed by Leave voters. So they did get through to people, they really did. And especially negative campaign emotions were amplified on Twitter. That's what Twitter does for you, it blows everything. Very, up very big. And we could see already that after the referendum, the discourse shifted very quickly from the relations between the EU and the UK to divisions within and among the voters and the political establishment of the UK. So, we had this shift from EU-UK relations to looking, you know, the soul-searching divisions in, within Britain, and more recently, the debate seems to be mostly on procedural issues, really of how to leave. A couple of questions I want to put out here. So there's a lot of polarization, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, where's the positive view of the EU? Does it mean if you're anti-Brexit, is that the same as being pro-EU? And being pro-Brexit, that may be anti-EU, but is it also anti-Europe? Or maybe all these questions don't matter and very soon we'll go into crisis management anyway. Um, and then, in the long run, perhaps when the economic and political parameters change in Britain, as they will one way or another, maybe we will see language emerging about you know, a new or different national identity. I want to end this lecture with well, a plea, really, yeah? in terms of polarisation, people shouting at each other, etc. How we can have a different way of talking about Brexit. I think one of the crucial things is to talk offline. Meet people with a range of opinions. And then all the nice bits. Listen without judging. Show respect. Try to understand the other's point of view. Be kind. And if you like to, we can start right now. Thank you. My word, that was really fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, we normally have some questions and answers. Um, does anybody have any questions in the room? Yeah, oh, there's one of that. Drew, is that Drew? Uh, do, you, do you work for any research on how each side construes the other side? Hmm. Well, that's a interesting question. I think that um, the research is done in the United That's interesting. I think that is... Um, I didn't personally. I'm not aware. I'm a bit... I'm aware of people talking about other voters 
you know, for instance, around age, so how young voters or older voters talk about each other. So like the old have sold us down the river or the young are blaming us for everything. So there's a study on that. I don't know how remainers and campaigners talk about each other. Maybe that's a study still to be done, but it's a good point here. Yeah. Is there a question there? I can't see who it is. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I know what the I know what the gender demographics are. Yeah. You know, it's um, because that was so obvious in our when we look at the vox pops. We did look a bit at our you know, are there any you know particular ethnicity dominating? Nothing that seemed out of proportion, shall we say? You know, so three quarters men among leaf waters, obviously more than half of the population. But we didn't see that it was, for instance, white dominated or not. Is the social media having a greater impact on the debate rather than the traditional newspapers and the like? Well, what has been found is that traditional newspapers did experience a sharp spike in sales in the half year up to the referendum. So people still use newspapers a lot and more than they do normally, you know, in the run up to the referendum to get their information and their opinion. People have also looked at how people engage with the campaigns, Facebook posts, Twitter, etc. I think it's hard to measure who had more of an impact, you know, it's very hard to say obviously that there is a clear cause effect relationship. You know, what we can say is increased media activity, both in traditional and social media. And how much there is a direct cause-effect relationship, I think that would be difficult to ascertain. And I, I think it's true, isn't it, that, that the print media now is engaging through the new forms of media in a way that mm. they, haven't, they didn't even do five years ago. So, yes, so it's well, the yes. merging mm. of, yeah. of the two. Do we have any more? I was very taken, and I hadn't thought about it before, by that slide that you put up. The, the, so the, you know, the Leave campaign was imperative, mm -hmm. and, and the Stay campaign was mm -hmm. not. That's fascinating. I hadn't even thought about it. And you said it's, it's so, so ob obvious yeah. even, when somebody even my, says. Even my linguistics colleagues who do analysis of this kind for you know, day in, day out didn't notice it, because it's perhaps too obvious to notice, and it's so simple. You know, it's linguistics 101. It really is. Yeah. So did linguistics win the, win the campaign for one side over another? Again, you know, I really can't go out and say there's a direct cause-effect relationship. I mean, it stands to reason. Obviously it does. It, you know, obviously it does. Otherwise I wouldn't do, be doing the work I'm doing if, it think, if I thought that it doesn't make a difference either way. Right, but I would be very hesitant to really say, well, there's a clear cause-effect relationship because I don't think you, that's measurable. It's all been very, very fascinating. Are there any more last questions? Mm -hmm.